Thank you, Dr. Fleischman. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the Council, members of the Board of Chancellors, and honored guests, it's my distinct privilege to address you this afternoon as President of the American College of Radiology. As I look out on this sea of faces, I'd like to recognize some of you who have helped me immensely in my journey with the ACR. To the entire ACR staff, but especially to Rachel Kramer, Pam Cassing, Cindy Moran, and Mary Jane Donahue, I would have had no roadmap to this journey without you. Many ACR leaders have provided me support as well, but I must single out Dr. Max Cloud, who was my initial ACR mentor and role model, Dr. Van Moore, who placed his trust and confidence in me, Dr. Harvey Neiman, whose vision made the journey exciting, and Dr. Jim Thrall, whose support was always there. I would also like to recognize and thank my family, who postponed events and family gatherings, and who understood my absence at not an insignificant number of birthday parties, so I could spend the necessary time serving this wonderful organization. They're all here today. My son Jay, a radiologist, and his wife Christine, my daughter Shannon and her husband Simon, and my five spectacular grandchildren, Lily, Ben, Will, Cece, and Claire. But the most important person without whose love and enduring support and encouragement I would not be standing here today is my wonderful wife, Trish. Thank you, my love. So it's with consideration of the welfare of our loved ones, our children, grandchildren, and future generations that I would like to share with you this afternoon my thoughts on the future of radiology. But before we get there, I'd like to take you back to 1970, when I was a fourth year medical student and not even thinking of radiology as a career. One of the popular songs of the day was recorded by a group named Three Dog Night, and its theme is clearly relevant to my thoughts today. Celebrate, celebrate, dance to the music. Celebrate, celebrate, dance to the music. During my entire career as a physician, radiology and radiologists have celebrated. We've celebrated tremendous advances in our technology. The development, maturation, and widespread use of ultrasound, computed tomography, magnetic resonance imaging, screening mammography, hybrid imaging, radionuclide x-ray and proton beam therapies have created a celebration that was beyond our wildest imagination in 1970. Not only a celebration for radiology and radiologists, but a truly significant celebration for our millions of patients whose lives have been enhanced by what we've been able to do for them. We have danced to the music and the lifestyles we've lived the professional satisfaction we've achieved, and the security we enjoyed for our families. And, but ladies and gentlemen, what will we do when the party's over? There's unquestionably a growing school of thought that this party, as we have so well known and enjoyed it, will soon be over. Are we prepared for that eventuality? Have we reflected sufficiently on its likelihood? Do we really understand why we're in this position now and how it came upon us? How will we address the future? Will we control it or will it control us? The answers to those questions can only be found by conducting a thoughtful analysis in which we take time to reflect on the past, define where we are in the present, engage in serious introspection, identify elements for optimism, and then engage a process of moving forward. To begin, I'd like to share with you some words spoken to the medical students at George Washington University. And I quote, it's a fact that can no longer be denied nor evaded that medical care has become so expensive as to place it in the class of luxuries. The speaker went on further to say, I'm amazed to find how few physicians realize how close we are to some form of socialization of medicine. They've been drugged into believing that bills before Congress are merely the ideas of crackpots, which have no chance of ever becoming law. Nothing could be farther from the truth. 
Just as sure as we're here today, if medicine does not offer a workable solution to this real problem, some plan will be forced upon the medical profession. The lowering of costs of medical care need not be made at the expense of the profession, but lower them we must, else we are all going to be working for the government within a very short period. The speaker's prescription for this problem was the socialization of diagnostic and laboratory services, the most expensive items in medical care, and the adoption of more business-like methods. Although many of you may think these words were spoken at the time of congressional wrangling over Obamacare, they were actually spoken by Major General Paul R. Hawley, medical director of the Veterans Administration, and published in the Atlantic Overseas Edition of Time Magazine on October 14, 1946. As we reflect on the past, two themes emerge. The first is that the cost of health care, particularly diagnostic services, has been higher than desired for at least six decades. And the second, although more subtle, is that providers of diagnostic services have historically not been regarded as members of the medical profession as far back as 1946. You might ask, has anything really changed in 67 years? But if it hasn't, how have radiologists been able to achieve the tremendous success we have over those years? And how is it that we've been able to celebrate and dance to the music? The history of radiology in the 20th century is a fascinating compendium of adventurous experimentation that has taken our specialty from its crudely primitive origin in 1895 to its spectacularly sophisticated status today. There's no question, we have been carried on a surging wave of tremendous technological innovation, but to our credit, we have actually participated in the research that made this innovation possible. And once the technologies were created, we radiologists continually found new ways to use them. But were we so excited about the limitless expansion of our clinical horizons that we neglected to address the cost? and neglected to directly address the general perception that we were not really members of the medical profession? For decades, radiologists were considered the physician's physicians. But when it came to actually consulting, or worse yet, disagreeing with a referring physician's orders, we were summarily relegated to the category of ancillary services by our colleagues. Likewise, when the Medicare program was created, we were initially included in the Part A hospital payment sector as ancillary services. Through the persistence and tenacity of our ACR leaders in 1965, radiologists emerged from that ancillary dungeon in the eyes of the federal government. But our emergence from the dungeon has been much slower in the eyes of our referring colleagues. Is there a lesson here for our future stature and status? We made a strong argument to Congress in 1965 that we were physicians and should be regarded as such in any payment system. Have we made that argument as strongly to our referring colleagues and patients in the area of clinical care over the past 48 years? Or have we been content to ride the wave of technologically driven success and continue to hide in the shadows of our magnificent machines? As that technology driven success escalated, we took great pride in our ability to make complex diagnoses, provide innovative and increasingly non-invasive treatments to our patients? But did we really regard them as our patients? Or were they the patients of other physicians whose patterns of consultation with us were simply relegated to us performing ordered tests regardless of the cost? We made a bold move in the late 1980s anticipating the advent of the relative value payment system. And in so doing, secured what we considered then and now a fair process to determine compensation for the work we do. But was that enough? As the volume of work rapidly increased, did we as individuals and groups anticipate the possibility that the costs would become unsustainable? Or were we happy with the financial success we were experiencing? And did we just turn the music up a little louder and dance a little harder? The ACR created its appropriateness criteria around the same time the relative value payment system was created. Did we, as practicing physicians, embrace these criteria and use them on a daily basis to take an active and personal role as true consultants on the patient care team over those past 20 years? Or did we find ourselves too busy and just simply perform every exam that was requested 
without a concern about our contribution to the total cost of health care. We need to take a closer look not only at the past history of medical costs and perceptions of radiologists, but also at our historical evolution as practitioners of clinical medicine. In 1946, when costs were considered unsustainable and radiologists considered as ancillary personnel, essentially all radiologists practiced what we would today call general radiology. Research, technological development, and creative applications thereof led to highly developed and continually increasing subspecialization of radiologists. Once again, we rode this wave of academic progress and celebrated our intellectual prowess. But did that celebration occur within a vacuum? Were we unaware that our non-radiologist colleagues were as advancing as, as fast as we were? That they could more easily understand the content of our images? Did we have the interest and take the necessary time to become equally familiar with ever-increasing subspecialized clinical patient management so we could function in our true role as valuable consultants? Did we become so immersed in the intricate details of subspecialized image interpretation that we came to consider the patient as merely the sum of many parts and thereby diminish the value of our ability as imaging consultants for the entire patient? We stand today as a specialty in danger of disaggregation, unknown to the vast majority of our patients, undervalued by our medical colleagues, and widely perceived as major contributors to the unsustainable cost of healthcare. Guidance for our future must be driven by an understanding of where and why we've previously succeeded, and where and why we've come up short. Understanding the past and how it relates to the present is a first step in creating an approach to the challenges of the future. A second and perhaps more important step is understanding ourselves. We each function as individuals with very personalized needs, desires, and perceptions of the world around us. We also function as members of small and large interactive groups of other individuals with a variable spectrum of personalized needs, desires, and perceptions. However, as radiologists, we have by self-selection accepted and embraced the common thread that binds us together. What is that thread? How many elements does it contain? And where is it in danger of fraying? How do we capture the essence of who we are? In 2009, a man named Simon Sinek introduced a concept that codified the common elements of successful businesses, organizations, and individuals. Mr. Sinek teaches, teaches at the Strategic Communications Program at Columbia University, and he joined the RAND Corporation in 2010. He labeled his concept the golden circle and compared it to functional layers of the brain. In the outer circle, he placed what we as individuals, groups, and organizations do. And he compared it to the brain's neocortex, which is responsible for language, rational, and analytical thought. The middle circle contained how we do what we do, and the innermost circle identified why we do it. These two inner circles were compared to the limbic brain, which is responsible for feelings and decision making. His theory, which he defends with many real life examples, is that the common thread of success involves both communication and understanding from the inside circle outward, rather than the reverse, which is a much more common and much less effective process. We all know what we do as radiologists and how we do it, but do we really understand why we do it? And can we effectively communicate that why to others as the initial concept and central core of identifying who we are? In my opinion, we are first, foremost, and always physicians. Each of us, as individuals, shares the common elements of an interest in science, an interest in humanity, self-motivation, and the ability to endure challenging work. However, our perceptions of what being a physician would entail when we made the decision to enter medical school probably varied widely and likely were very different from the reality of being a physician that we experience daily today. It was during the first era of managed care and capitation in the 1990s that my son was considering a career as a physician. I recall many of my colleagues at that time who were actively discouraging their children from that career choice. I told my son, as I would have told any young person at the time, 
that the choice of medicine as a career needed to be made for the right reasons. If the reasons driving the choice were to become wealthy, to have unparalleled prestige, to become completely autonomous, to retire early, and to live the good life, then he should consider some other career than medicine. But if the reasons for entering medicine were driven by an interest in science and humanity, a thirst for challenge, and a desire to solve complex problems, he would always make a comfortable living, be respected by his patients, enjoy working on a team, and most importantly, go home at the end of each day knowing that he made a significant difference in the life of at least one other person. That's my definition of Synex inner circle. Are we as radiologists individually and collectively content with that career scenario in 2013? Have we thought of it specifically in those terms? How have our self-perception and expectations been shaped by the technical, social, and scientific evolution we've experienced over the course of a short five-year career or a long 40-year career? I'd like to recall the words of Dr. Gieberto, who in his 2006 presidential address eloquently challenged us to explore what it means to be a professional and what duties and responsibilities radiologists have as members of the profession. He defined three cardinal responsibilities, and I quote, a duty to those we serve, our patients, a duty to those at whose pleasure we serve, our society, and a duty to those with whom we serve, our colleagues, and thus our profession itself. This concept of broad responsibility is another core element of why we are radiologists. And embedded in all three of Dr. Gieberto's cardinal responsibilities are the words we serve. As we move from the center of Cynic's golden circle into the outer rings of what we do and how we do it, our introspection should be driven by the core elements of responsibility and service. Have we measured up to the why? Are we aware of it in our daily behavior? Has it truly driven our career development, or is it sitting on a dusty shelf along with other lofty ideals? If we carefully examine the current status of the how and the what, I fear we'll find we've been thinking and acting along the outer margins of the circle, rather than starting from the center and moving outward. Over the past few decades, and perhaps more exponentially in recent years, an insidious and pervasive atmosphere of entitlement has developed in our specialty. We somehow have come to believe that our intellectual and financial success is somewhat of a birthright conferred upon us when we began our radiology residency. This delusion is further enhanced as we become practitioners, and the volume of our work seems unending. Eventually, that sense of entitlement breeds complacency, followed by inertia, and culminating in a staunch resistance to change. If service is one of the core elements of who we are and why we do what we do, then the entitlement, complacency, inertia, and resistance of how we do it has become the antithesis of the core. If responsibility is another core element, then we must ask ourselves if we have indeed discharged the duty of that responsibility to our patients and to our society, as Dr. Gieberto advised, or have we only discharged it to ourselves? Who has benefited most from our work as radiologists? This degree of intense introspection is necessary because without it, we will not be adequately prepared for the changes we need to make to secure the future of both radiology and radiologists. It's a universally known fact that change is inevitable. Nothing lasts forever. In his 2009 presidential address, Dr. Moore extolled the need for change and specifically emphasized, and I quote, we must not only embrace change as necessary for radiology and our profession to survive, we must be catalysts for change. If we are to become the catalyst for change, as Dr. Moore recommended, we must first understand the psychology of change and then apply that psychology to the actual process of making the necessary changes. In the early 1980s, Dr. James Prochaska, a professor of clinical psychology at the University of Rhode Island, and Dr. Carlo Di Clementi, professor and chair of the Department of Psychology at the University of Maryland, created what has become known as the trans-theoretical model of behavior change. Since its inception, this model has been continually refined, and its core constructs, known as the stages of change, have become widely accepted. Within this model, there are five stages of change. The first stage is called pre-contemplation. 
in which there's usually no intention to change behavior and in which most individuals are unaware of problems and think everything is just fine. This stage is typically considered a state of denial. The next stage is that of contemplation, in which people are aware that a problem exists and are seriously thinking of overcoming it, but have not yet made a commitment to that action. This stage is characterized typically by ambivalence and conflicted emotions. The following stage of preparation combines intention and experimentation, in which people intend to take action, but cautiously collect information about change and may experiment with small changes. During the fourth stage, the action stage, people actually modify their behavior and their environment in order to achieve the intended goal of the change. The fifth stage of the change is a stage of maintenance in which people work to consolidate the gains of the changes they've made and diminish the risk of relapse to prior behaviors. This model of psychology of change, once understood, can serve as the platform for the actual process of change. As radiologists, we function in groups, and it's highly unlikely that everyone in every group will spontaneously and simultaneously embrace this psychology. We must engage in a process for leading that change within our groups. There's no better model for the process of leading change than that offered by John Cotter, Professor of Leadership Emeritus at the Harvard Business School. Professor Cotter has been on the Harvard Business School faculty since 1972, is recognized internationally, and is widely regarded as the foremost expert on the topics of leadership and transformation. His eight-step process for leading change has helped hundreds of organizations overcome the dismal statistic that more than 70% of all major change efforts in most organizations fail. Whether it's the American College of Radiology with more than 35,000 members, or the small eight-person group of radiologists in a rural community, the same principles apply. The first step is for group leaders to establish a sense of urgency, to take members of the group out of their comfort zones, break through the layers of complacency, and make a business case for change that aims for the heart, the why, of Cynic's Golden Circle, rather than a mere appeal to an intellectually compelling rationale. The next step is to put together a small group within the organization that has enough power to lead the change. Cotter emphasizes that change leadership can't successfully rely on one individual because no one person can single-handedly develop the right vision, communicate it to everyone effectively, eliminate all the obstacles, generate short-term wins, and anchor those new approaches deep in the organization's culture. These necessary elements of change need to be led by a small team that has the power of position, the expertise and the credibility, and the leadership skills to make it happen. The next steps are to develop a change vision and then communicate that vision for buy-in by the group members. The vision must be seen as strategically feasible, taking into account the realities of the group, but should also establish very ambitious goals. The key elements of such visions for change or that they convey a clear picture of what the desired future will look like, that they appeal to the long-term interest of the stakeholders, that they contain realistic and attainable goals, that they are clear enough to provide guidance and decision-making, that they allow flexibility in light of changing conditions, and that they're easy to communicate. This last element is extremely important because no matter how well-intended and designed the transformational change may be, it will not happen unless it's communicated effectively. Once communicated, the change leaders need to remove as many barriers as possible, many of which may be embedded in the structure of the organization or in the attitudes of its members. The famous quote of Pogo, uh, we have met the enemy and he is us, comes to mind here. But I would contend that we are not so much our own enemies as we are obstacles getting in the way of our own progress. If the leaders of change can minimize those obstacles, be they practical, philosophical, or traditional, then a long-term vision for change can begin by engaging Cotter's sixth step, which is generating short-term wins that are related to the change effort. These wins must be the result of careful planning and effort, because they'll serve not only to raise the level of group enthusiasm, but at the same time, undermine the credibility of cynics and self-serving resistors to change within the group. Once these small changes have been accomplished, it's imperative 
that the transformation leaders launch more and more projects to drive that change deeper into the organization and ensure the process doesn't stall. A basic tenet of Cotter's process is that cultural change comes last, not first. It's only after the roots of change are firmly embedded that the new culture can be established. Cotter emphasizes that tradition is a powerful force and the culture change can only be kept in place if the majority of the organization believe that the new way is superior to the old. So having examined and learned from our past successes and failures, having taken a closer look at who we are and why we do what we do, having recognized the need for change and examined its psychology, we now need to embrace that effective change process so we can turn external challenges and adversity into opportunities, as well as create new opportunities for success from within. But how do we measure that future success? And what goals do we establish to achieve it? Is it measured by productivity and revenue? Is it measured by intellectual achievement? Is it measured by personal satisfaction? And who measures it? Are we the sole determiners of the metrics of our success? Or is it more appropriately measured by those we serve? In any case, it's incumbent upon us to prove the inherent and added value of what we do and how we do it. Because proof of that value provides the justification for and the definition of the why. Much has been written about the value added that radiologists provide to the healthcare enterprise. In a paper I co-authored five years ago, we defined value as the regard that something is held to deserve or the importance or preciousness of something. We defined value added as the extra value, sometimes hidden, often not perceived, that a service brings to its user. And we translated those concepts into real-world examples of the value added that radiologists provide. Those examples were extensive and covered a broad spectrum of value added from the perspective of its impact on patients, other physicians, radiologists themselves, society at large, healthcare institutions, purchasers of healthcare, and device manufacturers. But a paper in a journal is only as good as the action it engenders. Our target audience may or may not have read that paper, but even if they did, they would only believe in the value radiologists provide if they actually saw it in action every single day. Our challenge in the future is to put those words into action so the proof of our value is as easily recognized as the sunrise. As we look from the inner circle outward in our approach to the future, the core elements of the why should direct us in setting our goals as well as in how we achieve them. These core elements should also direct us in how we communicate our vision for the future to those three constituents we serve, as defined by Dr. Gieberto. Therefore, the question must be asked, what can you, as individuals and groups, do to secure your future success? You are certainly empowered to create the necessary changes if you recognize your power and focus it appropriately. In my opinion, the opportunities for future success lie in the broad areas that I'll characterize as scientific progress and delivery of care. Over recent decades, we seem to have taken for granted the ongoing scientific progress that has fueled our success, just as we've taken for granted the stability and growth of our practices. However, the recent process of sequestration by our federal government should be a wake-up call to us all, that federal funding of future research may well be in more jeopardy than we would like to believe. If that's the case, how will the necessary scientific progress in vital areas such as genomics, nanotechnology, and information technology be achieved? Our opportunities for future success are clearly linked to those applications to radiology. But reverting to behavior patterns of the past, where we took it for granted, just won't get the job done. We need to look at the why. We need to understand that we, the beneficiaries of future research, have a responsibility to support that research, conceptually, practically, and financially. If we do that and each practicing radiologist engages the necessary introspection and catalyzes the change necessary to make that commitment, our scientific progress will certainly facilitate a bright future for radiologists for generations to come. However, that scientific progress can only serve as a platform. And unless we redefine our delivery of care models, 
we will not achieve that bright future. Ralph Waldo Emerson said that people only see what they're prepared to see. So through the concepts I've outlined, let's all prepare ourselves to see a vision of our future. The vision that I see for that future is to have radiologists and our patients positioned at the center of the entire healthcare enterprise to completely transform that decades-old concept that we are an ancillary laboratory service. That will entail an enormous commitment to change across a spectrum of topics that will touch every aspect of our professional lives. We must support and produce not only scientific research, but also comparative effectiveness research, including cost-effectiveness research that determines where imaging utilization should be decreased, and more importantly, where it should be increased, as determined by the best outcome for the patient. We should use our superior ability as innovators, not only at the radiology society level, but at the level of each individual practice to leverage our information technology expertise as a means to enhance our role as consultants and to lead the development and deployment of the electronic medical record in our medical communities. Radiologists are now positioned better than ever to assume the central role on the patient care team, particularly in the acute and subacute care setting. Will we seize that opportunity? I think we must. One of the changes I see as absolutely essential to that goal is to restructure our practice business models, to permit sufficient time for practice members to capture the center of patient management. For the past few years, I've proffered an example of such a restructuring. What would happen to us if we allocated some percentage, say 10% of the radiologist workforce in each practice to engage in non-revenue producing work well, the immediate effect is that our incomes would drop by 10%. Would that kill us? I think not. Radiologists in the United States are still among the highest paid physicians in the world. Could it help secure our future? I think so. That time could be used to truly consult with our medical colleagues, explain the meaning of our reports, design a proper approach to guide diagnosis and management, interact directly with patients, even to the heretofore shunned point of discussing our findings with them, answering their questions, and thereby increasing their level of understanding of who we are and why we do what we do. Another change I see as essential to our central role on the healthcare team is changing our self-perception. Our current model of self-perception is driven from the outside of Cynic's Golden Circle inward. We present ourselves to the world first by what we do and second by how we do it. And therefore, our own self-perception is defined in those terms. In order to succeed in our goal to become the central leaders on the patient care team, we must change our self-perception to emanate from the center, the why, outward. We must perceive ourselves not as the doers of assigned tasks, but as the originators and planners of the diagnosis and management of our patients. Once we change that self-perception, we can more effectively communicate it to our medical colleagues and our patients, and thereby justify and solidify our central role on the healthcare team. If we are committed to optimize our central role in caring for our patients, we should understand that we also need to take a central role in creating a new business and policy infrastructure. These four facets of healthcare, research, delivery of care, business models, and policy are all tightly linked, and we can't be bold in one area without being bold in the others. Our ability to support research and allocate extra time to interact with our patients will depend on our success in generating new revenue streams through innovative, efficient, and effective business arrangements and development of sound and appropriate policy. The Accountable Care Act and its emphasis on quality will engender several approaches to new physician payment systems. But we cannot delude ourselves into thinking that one grand plan will be developed from the top down. Already, in many parts of the country, accountable care organizations and other risk-bearing and quality-oriented business arrangements are being developed, all at the local level. As radiologists, we must become centrally involved in the design and implementation of those arrangements. We have the innovative skills and the intimate knowledge of the existing payment system sufficient to become the primary leaders of this transition. Even outside those arrangements, we have opportunities to capture the center, 
through innovative business approaches, such as contracting with our hospitals for the non-interpretive work we do, or even contracting for complete risk-based management of the entire hospital imaging department. Traditional business arrangements are no longer sufficient to move us successfully into the future. Traditional approaches to policy development will also hamper our ability to move forward. We need to acknowledge and understand that one of the conundrums of healthcare policy is that its very nature requires it to be developed at the macro level using population-based evidence and population-based priorities. However, as we all know, healthcare is delivered at the micro level with individual decisions being made between one patient and no more than a few physicians. The resulting conflict, particularly with regard to utilization, is inevitable. We radiologists are well positioned as objective consultants to use that population-based evidence to guide the primary care physician or specialist in tailoring the appropriate diagnostic and management scenario, and thereby diminish or eliminate the conflict between policy and practice that we know today results in billions of dollars of unnecessary expenditure with little, if any, added patient benefit. As frustrating as it is to engage in health policy development, it's perhaps the area where the most change is needed at the group and individual level. When we talk about health care policy, many radiologists tune out and say, that's the job of the ACR. Some people complain that the ACR isn't fighting hard enough, that adverse policy decisions and payment cuts should have been prevented by the ACR. There's an acute sense of frustration that has nowhere to go except to criticize the college for not stopping the thundering train that's headed for the redistribution of the limited pool of Medicare dollars from specialists to primary care. When people say that's the job of the ACR, in fact they're correct. But what they don't realize by making that statement is that they are the ACR. We all are the ACR. And we all know much more about what we do, how we do it, and why we do it than the legislators and regulators who create policy. They're just ordinary citizens, just like us. And somehow we act as if we consider them to be unapproachable icons. Here's an opportunity to use Cynic's model of successful communication. And it's an opportunity that involves nothing more than sending an email, picking up the phone and having a conversation, or paying a visit to their local office. Here is a tremendous opportunity to capture the center of policy development, and it's available to more than 35,000 individuals. However, capturing that center will require a considerable change in our current patterns of behavior. Those of us now in practice need to understand and catalyze the entire spectrum of change necessary for a successful future. And we need to do it now and in the near term. We need to ensure that the roots of our culture change are embedded as deeply and quickly as possible. But perhaps our most important task is to instill that culture in our residents and teach it to our medical students. At yesterday's categorical course and at the upcoming Morton lecture and economic session of this meeting, the college is providing you with details of specific mechanisms and tools available to make the necessary changes. But you must understand that professional societies like the ACR can advocate, can educate, can innovate, and can propose solutions, but they cannot compel behavior. The necessary transformation must come from the hearts and minds of every radiologist in the land. And that transformation cannot be random, it cannot occur begrudgingly, and it must occur with enthusiasm. Our destiny is on track to reshape healthcare. And in that context, I would contend that the party is not over. It's just moving to a new location with new and better music. If we approach it properly, this could be the beginning of another golden age for radiology and radiologists. We have the intelligence, the analytical skills, and the technical and scientific resources to create a meaningful and successful future. Whether that happens or not depends largely on our individual and collective motivation, our understanding of who we are, our willingness to catalyze change, to sacrifice present gain for future gain, and our desire to take the bold steps necessary to reshape our specialty. So as you go forward in this endeavor, please remember 
that my words this afternoon are already part of the past. The future belongs to you. Thank you.